yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rappers fed with the church of time. So going forward from now the rest of the semester, as I said last class, uh, we're gonna be start discussing real systems. So no longer are we going to read papers like, here's how to do this one technique. We're going to focus on you know, one aspect of the database system. The goal from this point going forward is us to, to read industry papers uh, and, and understand how they apply the techniques and the methods that we've been talking about so far this semester into these real world systems. Um, so the sort of three goals are, as I already said, was how to take the things that we talked about, like the, the individual components, individual concepts, and then put it to, to, a, uh, to a full system. But then now you'll appreciate as you read things, either in, their, in like an academic paper, like, like the, Dremel, the Dremel one you guys read, or you start reading like marketing literature from companies, that they're gonna say things that are gonna be slightly different than the, the things that we've talked about, but you'll see how it basically comes down to being the same thing. So by understanding the fundamentals and the principles of how people build modern database systems, if somebody, some marketing guy comes out and says, we have this groundbreaking new technique, yada, 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 and it's just, oh, it's just SIMD, right? Like, you'll be able to cut past all the bull and figure out what they're actually doing. The other thing you also uh, you'll get from this is that you'll see, like, in these papers, they'll say, we did it this way because reason X, Y, Z uh, for these different uh, you, people building these full systems. And so you, now you build this sort of catalog in your mind of all these different scenarios where someone tackled the problem a certain way. And then if we're lucky, the paper can discuss, oh, we tried this, it didn't work, but then we tried that and it did work. Right, so now when you, get, you go out in the real world um, and you have a sort of database problem you have to deal with either as a, so a user of a database system or as a developer of a database system, you can, you can, you can call, you know, recall back to all the things we've talked about uh, this semester and see, okay, well, you know, Google had this problem, they solved it this way. Amazon, this problem, they solved it another way. And of course, it's always fun to make sure that I'm not making things up. Um, so I, I get something out of that. All right, so here's the agenda for what we're going to read. So obviously, today was about uh, BigQuery and Dremel. Uh, next class will be on Spark SQL, or the engine you'll read came out uh, in Sigma last year, for the, for sort of their engine called, called Photon. So then we'll discuss Snowflake. We'll have a guest lecture from Mark at DuckDB uh, next week. And then we'll discuss uh, Velox out of Facebook, and then we'll finish up with a guest lecture from Hippocrates on, on Redshift. Okay? So again, are these the, you know, are these the, the only OLAP systems that are out there? Obviously, no, uh, as you guys seen with DVD.io. Are these the best ones, and therefore that's why I'm picking them or reading them? No. A lot of it has to do with like what has, you know, you know I think good papers discussing what they've done. Um, and obviously, the bigger companies, uh, are in a position with, you know, with, with, with money to have pay for people to help you know, write papers. So they do the most, you know, they, they do the best job at least in a, in a research venue like Sigma or VLDB or CIDR, you know, discuss and disseminate uh, their methods and their ideas. One side thing I'll say also too is when you read these papers, uh, well, the, 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 the Dremel paper you guys read is the 10 year retrospective. So it's, it's looking back in 20, 2021 on what they did in 20, 2011. Um, Oftentimes, whatever you read about in a paper, if it's like, here, here's, our, you know, here's Google's, Google's new system, that'll be about five years behind. Because by the time it takes to actually build a system, write, you know, flesh it out, get it deployed, write all the patents, even if they're not going to actually publicly uh, gonna enforce those patents, you know, they want to protect themselves from other people. By the time you read the paper, it's about five years off. Right? So in the case of, again, the Dremel paper, it's a retrospective, so it was pretty state of the art. Um, but for Snowflake, you'll see a little bit of this. Photon is open, not open source, but like Photon is pretty, uh, it's pretty straightforward. But at least in Redshift, their papers are always, again, looking back a few years. And then DuckDB, there, there really isn't a canonical DuckDB paper, and that's why Mark's gonna come talk about it. So as we go through these systems, there are gonna be some reoccurring themes that I want you, I want you to pick up on. And the most obvious one is the, the, this notion of, of, of disaggregation or separating the compute from the storage. In the case of the, the, the Dremel paper, they're separating the compute from the storage, and in some case, for one particular operation, they're going to separate the memory as well, um, treat that as, as a service. But we'll see this reoccurring theme of like, oh, we're running in the cloud, we have these object stores, you know, we want to have the compute nodes be stateless and have the, you know, have the, the final resting place of the database is going to be on the, some object storage shared disk. 
Right? We covered this at the very beginning of the semester. I said, like, this is how people build modern OLAP systems today, which is, which is much different than uh, the conventional wisdom behind of, like, using a shared nothing architecture prior to this. Another big thing that's going to show up is the lack of statistics about your data, meaning you're not going to be able to run analyze, collect some summarizations or histograms, and then have a cost model be able to predict here's, you know, here's the, the, the expected selectivity of some kind of filter operation. And you'll see in the case of the Dremel paper, which I think does the best job of any system of being very aggressive about supporting adaptive query optimization or adaptive changes based on what the workers see on, in the data as they're processing and try to do late binding, late decisions in query execution uh, as much as possible. Snowflake does a little bit of this. Photon does, does a little bit of this. DuckDB is running on uh, embedded devices, but even then it may not actually have run analyzed on the data. Um, and we'll see a little bit, a little bit of some redshift as well. Of course, we also, uh, everything is going to be a column store. Um, but in the case of the Dremel paper, we'll cover this a little bit. They also need to support uh, things that don't look re relational. Um, so that means nested, nested uh, values, repeated values, hierarchical structures like JSON, XML stuff. And so in real world data sets, these, you know, these formats are very common. We can't assume that we're going to have this nice, beautiful binary columns in a PAX format uh, that we, we've been talking about so far this semester. So you got to be able to account for that. And the last one would be vectorized execution. Uh, pretty much all of the systems we, will we are going to cover is going to be doing vectorized execution. Uh, I don't think any of them, going back here, none of these are going to be doing, I mean, Velux is not a full system. With the exception of Redshift, none of these are doing query compilation. They're all, they're all, they're all going to be doing vectorized execution. And you'll see in the, the Spark paper next class, you'll see why they, they discuss. We used to do Cogen, but that was too much, you know, huge pain. We, we only do vectorized, like, vectorized execution. Right, again, so these are what we're going to see over and over again. And it's just a matter of seeing how they, what techniques, uh, what are the techniques we discuss out the entire semester, they're all going to apply in some way, some way, in some shape or form or another. Okay? I would say also, too, you're also, you're going to see in the experimental section, uh, you're not going to see interesting results because they're industry papers. Uh, they're not going to say, hey, we have, you know, Visa's our big customer. Here's their queries, right? They're not, they're not going to be able to share that. And they're also not going to be able to share absolute numbers right? because they don't, want the, they, want, they don't want their competitors using the, the research papers that they're putting out there in, in like marketing against them. So you'll see, you'll see normalized values. I don't think this paper even had any, any numbers. Um, so don't expect any real deep analysis being done in the experimental section. It really is discussing what they've done, uh, what their contribution is, and if you're lucky, you know, the scenario or what led them to make certain decisions versus, the, versus another. The bar for uh, in a peer uh, journal like, or, or periodical like Sigma or VODB or really any other, other area is typically lower for industry papers because they want to encourage industry people talking about what they've done instead of just keeping it hidden. Um, I, I'll say this. I'll believe this out. I was on. I was associate editor for VODB one year. <laughs> submitted the paper, and they never had submitted the paper before, and it was. <laughs> it was. It, it was okay, uh, but it wasn't as good as it should have been, uh, and it got accepted because they wanted them <laughs> much more. So again, the bar the bar is lower for industry papers. Again, it's not to say that it's like you can't just like. You know, put a poop emoji and submit that, right? That's not going to work. You got to, it has to be real, but it's, it's not as rigorous as, as like a regular research paper. Okay. So let's talk about today's paper. So the first thing I want to do is make an observation about, uh, so try to put this in the context for everyone to understand the significance of the Dremel paper. Um, and you got to understand, go back to 2011 when the original Dremel paper came out. Uh, this, this was sort of when, I would say, the, the height of um, Google's influence or Google's impact on the, on the database industry. Um, and for, a t for roughly a 10-year period in the 2000s and early 2010s, Google really was at the vanguard of building modern database systems. Like Oracle still existed, Teradata still existed, right? There's a, you know, a bunch, of the, 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 bunch of other systems were still around. Postgres was... was gaining popularity, MySQL is widely used. But really at the sort of the cutting edge, like large scale cloud-based database systems, um, Google was at, was at the forefront. Um, 
And so what would happen is anytime Google would release a paper, you know, it, not always in Sigma AutoBOD, not the database conferences, sometimes in the system conferences, because um, they didn't really have, you know, think of like Jeff Dean, he's more of like a distributed systems OS kind of person, not a database person. I'm not saying he, just, he, he picked where they, they submitted papers, but they would submit things like at SOSP and other things. But so every time Google put out a paper, then other people at other companies, other tech companies, would take those papers and write open source clones of them. And the mindset was that, oh, Google's so successful, Google's so big, uh, whatever they're doing is, is probably the right way to be doing it. So we, sh we should be doing the same thing. Right? Everyone's sort of copying what, 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 what they did. Right? Uh, in some cases, I think this is warranted. Other things, sure, may maybe less so. Um, but again, like, now probably when you think of like, you know, who's cutting edge for maybe database systems, you may think of like Amazon, because they're, you know, they're the biggest vendor. Um, it may, maybe some of the smaller startups. And so I, I still think Google, Google is still today at the forefront of a lot of things. But like, n there's a lot of papers that have come out in the last couple of years from Google that nobody's really like, oh my god, this is amazing. I'm going to make my own version of it. Right? And I think partly, too, is because the, there's enough tooling out there now where you don't need to you know, build everything from scratch. But back in the beginning of the 2000s, the, everything Google did, th there was always another clone of it, an open source clone. So this is just a quick, uh, this is an incomplete list. These are the ones I sort of could think of the top of my head, uh, and, and, I, and I could fit in the slide. But these are the ones, these are the, the systems that Google has released papers or publicly have talked about um, that I think had a lot of impact. And so one thing to point out here is, here's, the, here's in the 2000s, Right, this was when the NoSQL stuff took off because Google was at, was at the, and was pushing this idea that SQL is a bad, doesn't scale, we don't want to do this. So all the systems they were releasing or building internally and then publicly talked about weren't using, uh, were using uh, SQL. I mean, Chub Chubby was a lock service that's not exactly, you, wouldn't, you know, we may not necessarily need a, a relational database for that. But MapReduce and Bigtable were, were very influential. And then in the, in the, in the next decade, in the 2010s, Here's all the systems they put, put out that were using SQL, right? And if you maybe picked up this point in, in the Dremel paper, there's a sentence here where it talks about how in the beginning, Google says SQL doesn't scale, and that's why they built all these NoSQL systems. But then Dremel was one of the first ones that, that, that brought sort of SQL back into Google. And then people realized, oh, yeah, this is actually a good idea. They, you know, they, reinvent, they figured out oh, the stuff we figured out in the 70s, and they started building uh, SQL-based systems. So another one I'm not including here also too is like the, the file system. Technically a file system is a database system, but we can ignore that. Right? GFS, uh, Colossus, right? They inspired HDFS, Ceph, uh, Gloucester. So here's a bunch of these open source implementations that are based on 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 you know things that were developed at Google. Probably the most famous ones would, would be Hadoop and Spark off of MapReduce. Um, and then Zookeeper was a big deal for doing uh, uh, like distributed state management. But the one we're going to focus on here is obviously Dremel. Um, and then the open source clones of them, or systems that are heavily inspired by them, were Drill, Impala, and Dremio. We'll cover these in a, in a second. So for, actually, for this list here of all the Google systems, does anybody, can anybody know which one's actually open source? No, he says MapReduce, no. MapReduce would never open source. Yahoo implemented Hadoop as, as a clone of it. Test. Who has who's ever heard of this? This is a sharded version of it's a, it's a sharding middleware for MySQL. This was built by YouTube, and then YouTube open sourced it, and then we got commercialized it as PlanetScale. Right? So I think because uh, it was this, this is purely conjecture on my part, I think because like YouTube was sort of they're making so much money on the side, they kind of you know were autonomous and and you know, the lawyers couldn't, you know, didn't come in. You know, the, the big Google lawyer said, yeah, don't open source that. They were able to get away with, get away with it. Yeah, so of all, all of these, the only one that actually is actually public is the test. Now, of course, a lot of this stuff requires, on, requires would, would require major rewrites to, to not use internal Google services. Like Spanner can't run on the outside world because it rec rec relies on true time, their atomic clock stuff, right? Like, I'm not saying, oh, Google should have stopped what they're doing, open source everything. I understand why they wouldn't. Uh, but you know, and, and Amazon's certainly not any better. Um, but you know, at least one of them made up. Does Amazon have any open source DMA methods? Because I feel like the answer is 
Amazon, as far as I know, they have zero open source yeah. DB systems. Yes. Uh, but their product is selling them all of the service. Yes. <laughs> we'll cover this a little bit at the end. Like, like the cloud basically makes, it's, it's, you know, people talk about open, how open source is important. In the end, if you're selling on the cloud, less so. Yeah. This is my opinion. Um, for some things, like, like for like a key value store like RocksDB, or, you know, so, something very like an embedded system, uh -huh. I think it's very hard to like to say, oh, this is closed source and proprietary. Yeah. Uh, but for a large service like like Dremel or even like Redshift, it doesn't make sense. I will say one thing is, that, that is interesting is uh, Google announced was it last week with LODB, that's their version of Aurora at uh, at. At, at, yeah, it's Google's version of Aurora. It's based on Postgres. They actually have a version that you can run on-prem in a Docker file. So the idea is that you, you do development locally, and then uh, and then you know, then deploy it in the cloud. That part is interesting. I don't think anybody else has done that. Okay. Another one, actually, I'm not including here. Also, is they had a product called App Engine. I don't know if that's still around. It's sort of like Heroku before Heroku. Uh, but inside that, they had a, like a, I think a JSON database. I think that was the inspiration of also MongoDB too. So like, again, Google's influence for databases is, 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 was massive, and still is today. NAP is a really interesting system. They haven't come, come to speak, but they, again, it's a, like a, I, I don't see anybody building an open source clone of that anytime soon. OK, so Dremel. So this was originally developed in 2006. As a side project, they mentioned there was a 20% project of, of an engineer there. Um, and the problem they were trying to solve is that they wanted to be able to do quick analysis on data files or artifacts that were generated from other tools, other batch jobs, in particular like for MapReduce. So you'd run your MapReduce job to compute, generate some kind of data set. It would dump out a bunch of files on the Google file system. And then you wanted to be able to run SQL queries directly on it to do some quick analysis to extract some information from it. Right, and that, so that, that was that was the original goal of this. That, and then they used the term interactive to mean you wanted to be able to just run the queries directly on the data and not have to like ingest it and import it into an existing database system, define a schema, like do any like you know, any manipulation or transformation of the data. You just want to run the queries directly on the data where it exists. And this is what they mean by in situ uh, data files. The original version did not did not support uh, joins. And the original version actually was a shared nothing system. And again, in the paper you guys read, they talk about how this became problematic if it was a shared nothing system because as they added more people started more and more people internally at Google started using the database system, because it was a shared nothing system where the, where the compute was tied to the, to the disk, it made it hard to scale out because you had to provision more resources. So they rewrote it be late, late 2000, not 2010s. The late 2000s to be a shared disk architecture built on top of the Google file system. And then the, the paper you guys read came out in, the original paper of, of, of Dremel came out in 2011, but then they, uh, it got exposed as a commercial product called BigQuery outside of, uh, outside of Google in 2012, like available to people out in the outside world. So there was this little footnote in the paper you guys saw, it which says Dremel is a, a brand of power tool that is primarily relied on their speed as opposed to torque. Who here, has ever, who here actually knows what a Dremel tool is? So it's a, little, it's a little rotary drill like this, <laughs> all right? So it's not like a drill, you drill a hole, you drill like this little grinder or whatever to, to, to do woodwork and do, do other things, to cut things off, right? I imagine this is a lawyer's nightmare. It's like, hey, we have this important product inside of our, our uh, important service inside of our, inside of our you know, multi-billion dollar company, and we've named it after another company, right? That can't be, that's not a good idea. Um, so obviously, uh, I'm surprised they didn't like they didn't kill it entirely. Like you, you Google Google Dremel or Dremel database, you don't get the tool, you get them, right? But uh, this is above my pay grade. Anyway, so internally it's called Dremel, and for this most of this talk, I'll refer to that as Dremel. But publicly, it's 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 BigQuery. BigQuery has other stuff around it, like Dremel's sort of the engine. There's like the infrastructure, like the pretty interface and all that. That's part of BigQuery. But the core engine is what we care about. That's that's still Dremel. So the reason why I had you guys read the 2020 paper instead of the original paper is because, let's we'll see this in a second, one of the big concepts that come out of the, the, uh, in the, in the, the 
the, the, the follow-up paper is this notion of the in-memory shuffle, whereas in the, in the 2011 paper, they hadn't built that part yet. And so the, the, the reason why I had to read this one is because, again, realize they're talking about a paper you guys didn't read. You're like, oh, we, we tried this in the past in this other paper. Um, but it's that shuffle piece is, is the important thing. And it's really only BigQuery and Spark uh, do this shuffle, offer, uh, shuffle operation. So we'll go to more detail. That, that, that is a unique aspect of what they're doing. And remember I said in the beginning, this whole semester, in the beginning, we, we were going to talk about how to do query processing on a single node, get that part done right first, understand how that works, then we want to go to distributed environment. We'll see how to like, sort of stitch this all together. The shuffle piece is how we're going to be able to do that. Now, it's not to say not other systems don't do shuffle, but they do shuffle in sort of unique cases. Like if you're doing a shuffle join for, for distributed joins, right? You, you do a shuffle operation, a repartitioning step just to do that join, but they're not doing it in the way that BigQuery or Dremel is doing it at every stage of, of the query. That, that part is unique. All right, so the, the first thing, actually, I want, I want to go quickly over what the in-situ data processing stuff is. I think we talked about this in the beginning of the semester, but this is the idea that the, the database system is no longer the center of the universe and has, has con entire control of all your data files at your organization or your, or your company, right? So you think a traditional data warehouse would be, I have some giant, very expensive machine that I paid you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for, and all my data in my company has to go into to that database has to go into that machine. So that means I have to define the schemas, I have to do clean, clean up, and then I, I, you know, I bulk import it into the database system. And that's, that's the, the data's final, final resting place. But in, in, a, in a modern scenario, or, or modern organization, if you're especially running on the cloud, people don't want to do that. People aren't going to do that. It's too expensive, it doesn't scale. So instead, you have all these different units within your organization, and they're generating their own data files, and then rather having provision, you know, uh, a slice of, of storage space on this giant monolithic data warehouse, you just write it to S3 as a parquet file or an ORC file or whatever you want. And then you want to have a query engine or, or database system be able to execute queries directly on that data without having to import it. Right? Again, using the, the Dremel example as a motivation for this. So this is what typically people mean when they say, I have a data lake. It's, it's, it's an object store with, with a bunch of random files. If you're lucky, you have a catalog that says, here's what the files are, and here's what the schema is. Uh, but that's not always the case. And then a lake house will be a marketing term you'll see in the, I think, in the Spark paper. This just means the database system, the system top of the data lake, the, the thing that you run the query, run, execute the query on. So technically, Dremel is, is, a, is a data lake house system. So again, the goal is we want to minimize the amount of prep time you have to do for, for a user to start analyzing the data that you have. Um, and in the Dremel paper, they specifically mentioned that their users are willing to sacrifice a little bit of query performance in exchange for not having to do all this prep work ahead of time. So I'm willing to run a little bit slower because the, the, the data is not you know, formatted exactly in the, the way, the best way for the data system is ahead of time. The data system maybe has to do some discovery to figure out what's actually in the files when it starts scanning. Um, but that's okay because then you don't pay the penalty or it, you're not spending human capital, you know, cleaning up the data. So a quick overview of the key features of Dremel. And again, these are the things that we talked about throughout the entire semester. So we already mentioned that it's going to be a shared disk, disaggregated storage. I think I rely on an object store to store files in. Some cases will be managed, meaning the, you do want Dremel to, to define the, the, the encoding scheme for the data. In other cases, it could, could be a bunch of JSON or CSV files, and, and that's fine. The, they're going to do vectorized execution or vectorized query processing. There's actually nothing to discuss about this, because the paper doesn't really talk about it. They say they're vectorized. We know they're using intrinsics, because we asked the people. Right? We, this is table stakes at this point. Everyone does this. The shuffle-based stuff we'll talk about more in, in a second. The, the encoding scheme is, is entirely uh, column story based. They're using zone maps and filters to try to to sort of prune things out, as we talked about, before you actually have to start reading the data. Um, they're doing dictionary and RLE compression. There was a little bit talking about how to figure out the optimal encoding scheme, or sorry, the ordering of, of data within a partition so that you can get the best benefit of RLE. Uh, we won't talk about that too much. And then this is not in the paper, um, but in the commercial version of BigQuery, the only indexes they support are inverted indexes. 
right, to do full, like light queries and, and, and like uh, string lookups. So you can't build a B-press tree on any data. The system will maintain, if, if you use their native encoding, plus in Parquet and Orc, they have these things as well, they'll maintain filters and bloom, bloom filters and other things to dictionary, dictionaries to keep track of like what data is maybe within a column, within a block, but there won't be a, a global B plus tree index we can do for, use for lookups. They only support hash joins, so they don't, they don't do any sort merge joins. Again, there's nothing to discuss here because one, it's not public. Um, and as, actually, as far as I know, they're doing the non-partition version of this, right? Within within a single node. Obviously, when you go when you start shuffling things around, it's it's partitioned, but that's doing it at sort of multi-level. And the last one, they're going to use a, a stratified approach to do query optimization. Well, they'll have some a heuristic optimizer, some very light cost-based uh, selections for 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 corner cases, but then they're going to try to get most of the benefit by f doing things at runtime, by adaptive, adaptively changing the query plan on the fly, based on the data that, that they're seeing. So I'm going to spend most of my time on, on this piece and then uh, this last one here, because again, th these parts are unique or, and very interesting for, um, for Google or for Dremel. All right. So the way it's going to generate uh, execute queries is just as we talked about before. You have some SQL queries shows up. You have to parse it, plan it. Sorry, you have to parse it, uh, run it through the binder, bind it to, to you know, names, to actually identifiers. Um, figure out where the file locations are because you're running on, on a shared disk architecture. But then it's going to slice the, the query plan up, the logical query plan up into uh, stages, which are, as far as I can tell are roughly equivalent to the pipelines we talked about before. Um, and then within that stage, they'll have multiple parallel tasks. One key thing about the tasks, though, uh, is that they want to make sure that the, the amount of work that each task is going to do is deterministic and uh, repeatable or right, idempotent. Meaning, if I, if the task runs and then produces some output, and then I run it again, I should get the exact same result, and I can, I can just overwrite whatever the result is to, to the previous one, and it shouldn't shouldn't have any side effects or any any other problems. This is you know this obviously if you're running a select query, a read only query, this is easy to do because you're not modifying tables. That's fine, um, but the determinism part is important too because if I run the task uh, a part of the way. And then for whatever reason gets killed or gets, you know, I have to shut it down and, and restart the task somewhere else, I want to get the same result. So they don't talk about this, but, but I have some experience doing this for other systems. Um, they're just things like, if, you know, if you have a random number generator in, in, your, in your query, they call it the, the random function, you need to make sure that you have the right seed at the beginning of the query. Right? So that every, any, no matter where you run it, you, you produce the same result. It's things like that and, and other things with time. So the, the root node in the, in the sort of execution plan will get designated as the coordinator. And before you start running any of the query, the coordinator is going to go and get all of the file locations for the data you want to read as one sort of giant batch to the, uh, to the file server. And it talk, the, the paper talks about how prior to, to doing this sort of batch approach, all the workers at the leaves of the query plan would, would then make individual requests, and then the file server would get overwhelmed. So you do sort of do a batch request at the beginning, get everything you need, and then store that inside the query plan. So the, the workers, when they start running, they don't have to go do any lookups. They know exactly where they need to go ahead of time. So let's look at a really a simple query plan like this. I do some lookup where you find all the articles with, with my last name in, in it, which I, don't, I actually don't, don't know how many there are. So the data at rest is going to sit on the distributed file system. Again, they're, they're going to be using Colossus for this. And again, this is an internal thing at, uh, at Google. But think of, it, again, think of it like Ceph or S3 on the outside. So you have your coordinator node. Uh, it's going to be responsible for uh, scheduling or firing up all the workers we want for, for the first stage, like say we're doing the partial group by. So these workers are responsible for retrieving the data from the, uh, from the file system, do whatever computation that, that they need on it, and then the output is going to be written to this uh, shuffle service. And the goal here is to store everything in memory so we're fast. And then that the next stage will then read data from the shuffle rather than reading from the workers themselves. Right, so they all can write to this thing. Uh, and I'm just showing this as, as an amorphous blob. It could, be, it could be individual nodes. It could be one single node. For our purpose here right now, it doesn't matter. 
And then the shuffle can provide information about what data it was given, but to the coordinator, you know, like, is there, are we, are we, are we underutilize, overutilize, we have skew, right? Condition, additional things like that. And the coordinator can then decide, okay, for the second stage, uh, here's the number of workers I'm gonna need, here's the data that they're all gonna process, uh, and then the workers know how to go then fetch this data from the, the shuffle service instead of going from the Jupyter file system and instead of going directly from the previous nodes, or the, the previous workers in the previous stage. So the paper doesn't talk about this, but that's why I was saying it's not exactly a, a true pipeline breaker um, with, when you have these sort of shuffle stages. There's some cases where you could have these workers start speculatively executing and, and retrieving data that these guys are, are generating before they even finish. So this model here comes from, it's, it wasn't invented by, uh, by Matt Produce or Hadoop and stuff. Um, Distributed databases, as I was saying, we're doing this back in the late 80s, early 90s. But this idea that you're going to do this at every, between every stage is something that, that is somewhat unique to, to, to MapReduce. And uh, the Dremel guys are, obviously took inspiration from this. But the reason why MapReduce sucked to, to do this kind of stuff was instead of writing into an in-memory you know, key, key value store, which is essentially what this is, it would write the data back to the distributed file system. And in, by default for Hadoop HDFS, it would do three copies for every write. So for every, as, as I ran my query, your worker produced output, you wrote it back to HDFS, it would then make three copies. Uh, didn't uh, MapReduce actually write the disk for each needed data? And only after one iteration, it goes back to the statement is uh, for the shuffle phase? Yeah. Like, the statement is, didn't MapReduce write to like, the local disk? And only after one iteration. Like if you if you were to run say an ML job on MapReduce after a whole iteration, it would write to HDFS. Like the intermediate data would be stored in local disk. It was just it wasn't. Yeah, I I, I had to go. I, I double check. This is like 2008, 2009. They, they might have obviously fixed that. I, I forget. But they that is still the same. Like like you were writing to disk, and that sucked, right? Um, so anyway, so they're running. They they have as we'll see in a second, they have dedicated hardware just to do this, which can spill to the distributed file system or disk if they run out of space. Uh, but it's, it's because it's in memory, it's fast. Actually, I don't know if I have to bleep this out too. They actually also have custom hardware on these, these dedicated uh, uh, shuffle nodes too, just to do the fast hashing and partitioning. Right? So this is a good example where Google is, feels like this is super important. So they'll, they'll actually fab hardware, similar to the, the way they fab TPUs, to handle this particular step. And that's unique to them. All right, so then the next stage, again, they, these, these workers are producing output. They write everything to the shuffle store. And then we fire up the, the last stage to do the, the sort and the limit. And then it produces the result in the distributed file system. Um, and then the, the coordinator can then, then pass along the result to the client, depending on how, how it was accessed. So one thing they also talk about, too, is that these workers are running all the time. So Again, I'm not trying to like. Has it? Here's a modern, you know, a modern OLAP system versus like MapReduce or Hadoop from, from over a decade ago. Like in that environment, you would for every sort of map job, you would spin up the JVM, do whatever task you're going to do uh, on the data you were given, and then go away. So that that spin up time was was non was a was was not how to say, but well, was not minuscule, and it could actually eat to the total time of the query. So these workers are always running, and they're not always just—they're not dedicated to you as a customer. Meaning, like these workers are always running in the giant cluster of for, for BigQuery or Dremel, and they can then be used for any any particular customer. And so they have the ability to have a custom thread scheduler on the actual node itself, where if they know that a customer has has paid for dedicated resources to provision resources, and it's running a job from from some you know some random user. They can, you can get preempted, you can put aside, so that they give higher priority to the customer that's actually paying for dedicated or, or expected results and performance, right? And they can do that because they, contr they control the whole stack. We'll see something similar in, in Snowflake uh, in next week. But again, the idea here is that like, you don't, you're not provisioning any resources. This is one giant cluster, right? And I've been told that the, uh, they also, they've also, like, Google said that they, they found, because they're running on, like, 
Borg with like, you know, their giant uh, container farm, uh, <laughs> that they sometimes have problems because they'll land on, the queries will land on boxes that were like also doing YouTube encoding, right? And which is CPU intensive. And so they have to make sure they like, they preempt that and take, care, take over that thing. Um, that's actually outside the worker. That's, that's, on a, that's on the box itself. So, okay. So again, so there's this, there's this notion of, of scheduling so within the, across the giant cluster, but then there's scheduling also within the worker itself. So within one worker also too, it's multi-threaded. It could be doing a bunch of stuff for, for a given task. Right? It's not like you know, one thread is doing all this work. Um, and so they'll, they'll do scheduling inside of the, the worker itself. Yes? So you, your question is: Does all do all do all Google database services run on top of Borg? I, I don't. I don't know. I see. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me, right? Yeah, no, but it would be like really difficult to create like a generalized thing that like also has like high performance for like everything. Or maybe it's just really crazy. for 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 like the 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 the, the, the container coordinator. Yeah, I don't know. It's like too many. It's, it's Borg is basically. It, it's like Kubernetes before Kubernetes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not doing, like, like Kubernetes or whatever Borg is not saying, okay, this query is going to go here, this query is going to yeah. go there. Like in terms of individual tasks, yeah, there's a yeah, there's a schedule coordinator. <laughs> sorry, that does that. Um, but then, then and then Kubernetes or Borg is deciding, okay, well, this task for this operation, sorry, the Borg is saying, okay, I have a worker here that's running on this box. And then something else is going to tell the worker what to do. And that's, that's the data system. So your question is like, maybe another way to ask your question is like, is something like Borg or Kubernetes, is that impeding the performance of the database system in the same way that like the Linux operating system can impede us on, on yeah. trying to run a single box? That, that I don't know. Oh. I, I, I think the answer is no. Um, for individual queries, but you can imagine, you know, there's probably always better scheduling decisions you could make. I don't know whether it, uh, yeah. I, I, just, I just don't know what, what they would be to over, yeah, to overwrite. Yeah. Just doing it yes. I'm guessing mo most of the services are running on Borg. I don't see why you would want to run bare metal for anything. Right, like e even if like, even if th these things are running on custom hardware, like there's no reason you just you know they're managed by uh -huh. Borg. That's fair. But but you know they're dedicated. The pod is whatever dedicated to to to, to the service that you're trying to run. Okay. The shuffle. So as I said, this is unique to BigQuery, in that they're one of the few data systems that does it does this. Um, it's not again. It's they didn't invent it. It's, for, it's you know it's from other other aspects of distributed computing, distributed processing, but it's interesting how they apply it. And then we'll see that it does open up opportunities or open up different optimizations that we could do that would be otherwise difficult to do if we weren't doing this the shuffle shuffle step. So the shuffle is basically a producer consumer model where we want to, it's going to wait for a workers at one stage to to disseminate and send out the results from, uh, the, from their processing and their stage onto to the next stage. So the workers are doing some execution. They produce output. It sends it to the shuffle nodes. The shuffle nodes are going to sort this in in-memory hash partitions, uh, where the hash is going to be like whatever the, the, the group by key or whatever it is that, that's in your query plan. Um, and then the, the next stage, when it gets fired up, those workers are going to retrieve the data from the, uh, from, the, from the shuffle service and not from the individual workers. So again, everything's going to be in, uh, in memory, but it can spill to disk storage if, if, it, if it gets too big. And I don't think the paper says what percentage of the queries get spilled to disk, but I imagine it's, it's low. Right? Again, the shuffle paradigm goes back to the 19, 1980s. At least I know distributed, there was early distributed databases that were doing this, um, but it's mostly used for joins. All right, so the idea is this. So here's our worker. 
uh, so here's our, here's our, here's our sort of say our current stage, and the worker is going to have sort of a producer, a consumer API, a producer API. So the consumer is just retrieving data from whatever it is the the, the previous stage, or coming from the distributed file service uh, file system if we're, if we're reading the, the original files. And then as they execute, again they they produce output, and you hash the the data on some key that everyone that everyone is, agrees upon, and then they send the 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 data to the different nodes. And if it gets too big, we can then spill to distributed, the distributed file system. And then in the next stage, these guys can start running you know, once the previous stage is finished, or they can start retrieving data speculatively from, the, from, the, from the, the shuffle nodes and start doing whatever processing that they want. And then so on. Again, they produce output, uh, which also come from, they know, they know they may need to go read from the distributed file system, but they, can, they, they produce output that then goes to the, the next shuffle service or the final output for, for the query. So the shuffle phase are essentially checkpoints for the query's lifecycle, or the, the, the query's lifetime. So like once all the, uh, going back here, once all of the, the workers within the current stage are done and have produced their output, all right, these, you know, these can all then be reassigned to work on other tasks. Right? And so no matter if now in the second stage, if one of these nodes goes down, one of the workers goes down, I don't have to restart the entire query because I have the ephemeral state or the intermediate results stored in, in, my, in, in my shuffle service. So that is actually a big difference between sort of traditional shared nothing or uh, OLAP systems and a system like Dremel. Right? This is actually one of the benefits that the MapReduce guys claimed when, when, when their system, they were promoting their system. In a traditional distributed OLAP system, if one node goes down, the entire query is killed. Right? Because they, they were not storing the enemy results for performance reasons. Yes? So when a worker wants data, it pulls data from the distributed like distributed memory to its own memory? Like how what kind of what is the API? Like how how does it compare latency wise to write to another So your question is, what is the overhead of, say, this worker here going to this to retrieve the data it needs? Like, again, over, over TCP IP, nothing fancy, versus going directly from here, yeah. right? So it's, it's going to be slower, but as, as they, they talk about in the paper, because you have now this, you have this sort of this abstraction layer between the producer and the consumer, it opens up, it makes, one, it makes software engineering easier. Right? It makes it easy to now, uh, you know, these, these less state you have to maintain on this side over here, because now if I'm getting back from the workers, I got to know who those workers are. In this case here, I don't have to know that. I just, I just know here's the, here's some IP, or sorry, here's some identifier I use at the shuffle service that tells me what data I need from my previous stage. Like all that now of like who, how the data got to you is hidden. So. They talk about, I think it's, they say it's, it seems counterintuitive, right? It seems like this, this extra step makes things slower, but it actually turns out to, to be a benefit. It also has the really, yeah. Like, yes, yeah, so there's, we'll get that in a second. There's software engineering benefits you get from this beyond just performance. And I'm not sure if it actually makes OLAPs worse, because they're all connected to the same network. The point is, they're all on the same network, assuming the network is fast because it's Google or whatever, right? I mean, Yes. But it won't make that much of a difference because a worker won't have that much memory in itself. So you have to fit from multiple workers. Yes. Whereas in case of in memory storage, you can just get all of it from one location. Yes. So just to repeat what he said, like these workers aren't, aren't going to have a lot of memory. These are larger memory machines, right? Uh, and yes, there's an extra hop, but like they're going to be in this, at least in the same data center. Like they're not going to be the other side of the country, which that would take too far, that would be too long, right? They're going to be close enough, and the inter internal bandwidth is going to be super high with low latencies anyway. So, and then the uh, these things are going to have more memory to keep everything in memory versus over here, you, right? Then you also have potentially keep state of like, okay, if I start exceeding memory on the workers, I got to know what I've given out, so I can start evicting it. But then, like, if again, if this guy fails, I got to go get it again, 
But then I've already reassigned these to go work on other stuff. But from a, like a database perspective, if you have a transaction running and now you want to roll back a transaction. No transactions. Don't, don't, we're not doing transactions. Nothing? No transactions? Okay. Yeah. Ignore that. Not in this paper, right? I don't. I don't know about. I don't know about, about, about uh, the, the 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 BigQuery service. I, they, I think they support DMLs, but I think it's like it's not. They're not going to be optimized for that. Yeah. Yeah. This is not. So how do they support SQL without assets? Uh, well, they support it. It's not they just, they just run without you, transactions. Yeah. Like you're, you, you can't do like multi reads that are transactional. But, like, but, but, but that's not the scenario this is being used for, right? It's not like I'm trying to run queries. Yeah, like I'm not running, like, like, like I'm not worried about inconsistent reads from, like, I run this query and then I run it again and I get different results. Like, because I'm reading a bunch of historical data that maybe is updated periodically in a batch job. I'm not, like, reading the live stream as it comes in. There's other systems that can do that. Uh, but that's not what this is for. Yes? Does uh, the, each worker still need to have his own uh, cash manager? So his question is, does each worker need, need to have his own cash manager for uh, caching uh, what? Any uh, access to memory to use it to bandwidth. Uh, oh, okay. So, so, yeah, so the paper talks about how they have disaggregated memory, right? Yeah. That's only for this, right? So for, for each worker, it has local memory. So I re, I'm retrieving data from, from, from upstream, or because downstream, depending on the way you look at it, from whatever came before me. And I'm gonna, try, I'm gonna keep that in memory. If I need to spill to disk, I'll spill to disk. We'll talk about how they repartition to avoid that, right? But like, this thing has its own memory, but it's ephemeral, right? I, I get whatever data I wanna process for my, my task. I crunch on it using all the techniques we talked about this class, this semester, and then I shove it out the door and move on to the next thing. Okay, so the in-memory storage still only stores the results, but not, for example, the data. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not storing like ephemeral state of like, here's the hash table I built to do my join on my worker node, right? You're doing, you, that one you use local memory. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so if Snowflake doesn't do the shuffle, right? Uh, their worker nodes will have, they can write to a local cache themselves, like a local disk as well, right? For like, so if they, uh, how do I say this? Like if you're reading from S3, they don't want to pay that, like Snowflake doesn't want to pay the cost of reading, reading from S3 all the time. So the worker nodes are a bit more stateful than I think in, in the example here, where they will have a, a disk cache, they can cache results, right, of, thing, of objects you're, think, you're fetches from S3. As far as I know, they're not doing that here. Yes? Uh, so we under, I understand that like, because of these checkpoints, if there's any worker falls down in the previous, it doesn't matter for the next stage, but like, so like in the case of the, like the shared map, How's that? How's that fault tolerant? Yeah. I, I, I gotta say, I'll fix. Yeah. They have redundancy. They write the three steps. Yeah. yeah. Like redundancy for for a key value store is in the same data center as a solve problem. So like, yeah. And there's no. I don't. There's like. How's this? The use case for this, for like what the like the operations that this thing is supporting. Like they're not like get and sets are not widely. It's it's not a novel paradigm that you need something like you can use raft or whatever the other techniques for as well. Okay, so as I say, because they have this explicit shuffle step, it opens up a bunch of stuff that like that go beyond uh, that. Like you would want to have an idea system anyway, but like now you don't have to. 
it makes it easier to implement these, these additional features because you have this, 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 this abstraction away of, of this intermediate uh, storage. So the first one, we, I think we mentioned a couple times, the, for fault tolerance and straggler avoidance. So if a worker doesn't produce the, the test result um, uh, it, within some, 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 some threshold or some timeline deadline, that the, the coordinator can then fire up another worker and say, OK, you're responsible for executing this task now. Right? And we can do that without having to rebalance anything upstream. Right? It's isolated to just what happens in that stage. Again, this is why we want the task to be deterministic. So like, no matter how many times I rerun it, I produce the same, always say the same result. It's also going to have the benefit, and we'll see this when we do dynamic repartitioning, because now we can scale up and scale down the number of workers within stage, pretending, because we'll know what the size of that stage is. And we, get, we, sort of, we have this checkpoint and say, OK, well, here's all the results from this. Once I have everything, then I can decide, OK, how many workers I want to go on the next task. Or if I, get, I, I have some default setting or initial setting I have for the number of workers I have, once I see the full output of the, of the, of the stage within my in-memory shuffle, shuffle nodes, I can then decide where to scale up and scale down. And that's just a matter of like when one, if I want to scale down, when a worker is done with the task, I just you know, tell it to work on something else instead of this query. So for the straggler one, it's pretty simple, right? So say that, again, all these, these stages are producing, their, the workers in this stage are producing their output. But for whatever th reason, this one is slow. And then after a while, we're, like, we're still waiting for it. We haven't gotten it yet. So the coordinator says, OK, well, this guy is never going to finish. Let me just go kill it. And then I'll reassign the task to uh, this node here. Then now, once I get all my results, the, the coordinator can look at the statistics of, of the data that's generated um, across all the, all the partitions that, that got stored in the shuffle phase. And then it can decide, OK, well, this is actually way more data than I thought was going to come out of the previous stage. So let me fire up or let me get some new workers that are available in my pool and have them be involved in executing the query as well. Or well, again, the same thing, I, I, could, I could even already start running, realize that I want to use these resources and workers for other queries, and I could take them away. And it doesn't change, it doesn't change anything of how I coordinate things over here. It's all isolated within a single stage, because they're just retrieving tasks to say, OK, go, get, go fetch the data I need from the, the in-memory storage. Is that clear? Yes, sorry. The question is, uh, if resource allocation is an internal decision, how do they charge customers? I think the, the big query pricing model, ignoring the provision and guarantee capacity, is you pay on the data, amount of data you read. Okay. Right? So like, uh, I, don't, I, I might be wrong with this. You don't pay for compute. So like, if I have a query that uh, reads one terabyte of data, and I, I do Bitcoin mining while I run the query, versus I just do select star and produce the output, you don't, there's, no, there's no pricing difference. They'll definitely charge you to get the data out. Like, don't forget that. There's all egress and ingress charges for networking. That, that they mark up a lot. But the actual query itself, they charge for the data you read. I think the Redshift model works the same way as well. And then you can, you can get provision or get guaranteed performance. You pay extra for that. OK, so I want to talk about now how they do query optimization. Because I think this part, again, this is interesting. You'll see a little of this in Spark as well, uh, or at least Photon next class. So we spent over a week uh, discussing query optimizers. And we made this big, big assumption that a lot of the techniques are going to rely on having a cost model that allows you to compare whether one query plan is better than another, or whether one physical operator is better than, than another. But now, if we're assuming we're, we're in this in situ, you know, uh, in situ data analysis world, or this data lake world, where we have a bunch of files that we've never seen before. We, we didn't run analyze on because they're outside of the purview of the database system. The database doesn't control them. Some other job is you know, lo loading up into S3, and then somebody asks us to run a query on it. But we haven't run analyze yet. How are we actually going to support this? And in the paper, they don't have exact numbers. They mentioned that they say a large percent of the Dremel queries that they support are running are running over data that, that the this, this system has never seen before. So it's like a bunch, I got a bunch of rando files. I don't know what's in them. How do I actually start doing query planning on them? The other challenge is going to be, we didn't really talk about this this semester, but a lot of these systems support what are called connectors, where if you have like an existing Postgres, MySQL, whatever you want database system, uh, you can connect your OLAP system, like Dremel, 
to it. And, it, and then Dremel says, OK, well, I see these tables. I see the, 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 here's the schema. I can then now run queries on my, uh, you know, my, my Postgres database through, through BigQuery. And depending on the expressiveness of the API, you can either you know, do some push down of like do some filtering on the, on the actual data system itself, or it's going to do something stupid like select star from the table and pull everything in and then do the processing on it. Right? So again, in this environment, again, how do I do query planning where there's some black box system that I don't control that I, get, I have to start making estimations about selectivity of predicates in order to do query planning? So the way BigQuery is going to work, or Dremel is going to work, is they're going to be using a stratified approach. We're doing sort of heuristics and a, and a very simple cost-based optimizer uh, to generate a preliminary physical plan for the query. And then at runtime, as they're running the query, they're going to look at each stage and make decisions on whether they should change the query plan as they're going along. So the, the, the sort of the, the, the hard coder static rules, the, the, the ones without a cost model, are the standard things you would expect, like predicate push down, foreign key, primary key hints. Um, if they, they have special code or they have uh, custom checks to see whether you have a star schema uh, or a snowflake schema, and they can propagate the constraints from the dimension tables to the, the fact table to try to do early filtering on the fact table. right? These are all sort of standard techniques. They do some basic join ordering, again, based on the, 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 the join ordering for things like if I know it's, a, it's a, again, a star schema, I'll have the fact table and I'll have that write up my pipeline and join that with the, the dimension table. So there, there's standard tricks everyone does. As far as I can tell, the only cost based optimization that they're, that they're, they're doing are when you actually have statistics, which makes sense because how do you do cost based estimation if you don't know anything about the data is to have a cost. So, if you define a materialized view on in, in, in Dremel for you know an existing data set, obviously the data set is going to run that query, materialize the view, like think of like result caching, and now it knows something about the result of that of that that of that materialized view. So you can use that the, the sort of standard techniques to figure out whether you know is one view better than another if your query is accessing it. But that's not the common case. Most people are running directly on, on raw tables. So the basic, again, the basic idea is that we're going to use a bunch of rules to figure out a, a, a sort of rough sketch of what the initial query plan is going to be. And then at runtime, we'll look at the estimates, or look at the, not the estimates, the actual data that, we're, that each state is producing, and then make other decisions. So what Dremel is going to be able to do is that before each stage starts, you look at the results in the pre-seeding stage, and then you can make different decisions. Now, that's, I won't show this example, but it's not entirely true. You could actually have a stage start running. You could have two stages in parallel, like if you're doing a join. And then you realize that, that, that one of the stages is actually not needed anymore, and you can go ahead and kill it. Like, so the example would be if I'm doing joining two tables, if I, I think I'm going to do a, uh, a shuffle join, where you sort of repartition everybody and then do the join locally. If you recognize one table is really small, you kill one side of the shuffle and then switch to a broadcast join. But, but the basic idea is still the same here. Right? Actually, that's what I'm saying here. But so a bunch of these we've already covered. We, we talked about how to change the number of workers in the stage. Uh, they can also do things like recognize that the they have different algorithm implementations for physical operators. One that's actually for, for really big partitions, maybe one for small partitions. They're optimized. They're completely separate code paths, and they can pick which one to use based on again the result of the uh, of the of the results of the previous stage. And then dynamic repartitioning is is an interesting one as well. So say we have a query that's producing uh, in one stage, a bunch of workers. They're producing some results, right? And they start filling up, say, two partitions in our shuffle nodes. And then if the coordinator is getting sort of periodic statistics from the, the partitions, and it recognizes that the second one is about to overflow, it's built a disk, right? It's, 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 for whatever reason, the data is skewed, and everything's going to, to this partition here. So what it can do is it can then Instruct the, the shuffle nodes, like, okay, you actually have more partitions now. Allocate that memory. Instruct the workers to say, you know, don't hash anything that hashes to this partition anymore. Do another round of hashing on it, like basically recursive partitioning like in grace hash, grace hash joins. Do another, another round of hashing, and then write all the data to partition three and four instead. And then, and then they all fill up. Then once this is done, you then fire off a new, another worker that does this repartition step 
that goes back and reads the data that, from the shuffle nodes that you, that you previously put into the overflow partition, or the partition that was out to overflow, and then rehash it again to fill up the, the, the two ones you made, and then kill, kill off, kill off the, the extra one. Right? Again, this is a very, very powerful concept because they're trying to avoid disk as much as possible. So if you think of like, uh, you know, when we talk about doing hash joints, if our hash table got filled because we didn't predict the, the, you know, the size of the hash table correctly because our estimates were wrong, what do we have to do? Stop the query, stop the join, create a new hash table and throw away the old one, right? Double the size and, and, and create a new one. In their case, they don't want to do that. They just, they, they can spin up the new partitions, do again, do the recursive partitioning or recursive hashing to make them go to the new, make the data go to the new ones, and not have to change anything below us, right? So th this is a very, again, this is very powerful. This is not something that most systems can do. And because, and, and because they, they, you don't know what the data is going to look like when it's content, and like you don't know what the skew is going to be, you have to have this dynamicism in order, in order to support this. Because you're dealing with data you've never seen before. All right, I want to quickly finish up and talk about the, the storage stuff. So as I said, they, again, they're relying on a distributed file system. In the case of Google, it's Colossus. They're using that to scale the storage capacity. And the paper talks about is like because you know, even though they're relinquishing control of the, the storage infrastructure to the file system team, the benefit of that is as the file system gets better, because you know, the, the other team is still working Colossus, as Colossus put out new improvements, their data system got better because they became, became more responsive and faster without him, them having to do anything, which is fantastic, right? So it's sort of what you think about is like as Amazon improves S3, makes S3 faster, if our system is built on top of it, we get that benefit for free. So I think that's a really important uh, lesson from this as well. The, when they do manage service or have their own encoding, uh, sort of uh, database encoding or file format, they're relying on this thing called capacitor, which is not open source. Uh, you can think of it like it's basically equivalent to like Parquet or Orc, where there's like a file format that or specification that defines how to, how to encode the, the data, and how to do compression, and so forth. Um, and then they also have utility libraries for actually accessing data from it. Um, similar to what you guys built for in project one. So the they talk about how they uh, when, because they have to deal with these nested data structures because a bunch of random JSON stuff. They want if, if you then convert that to capacitor format, uh, they're going to keep track of all the, the the information about how fields are repeated, whether they exist or not, within columns themselves. So you can do the traversal of the. You can scan along a column without necessarily having to go scan down into the ancestor fields within, uh, an, uh, within, a, within a tuple to figure out whether data actually exists or not. And only go read the data from the, uh, the columns that are defined separately if you actually need it. So it's a way to take sort of a, a row-based, sort of a, a sort of naturally inherent row-based uh, data model like JSON and convert it to a columnar format. And that, I think that's very powerful. That's very important. Uh, for how they're going to store the schema, again, they, we don't talk about too much about catalogs, but they're, they're super important. Um, so they talk about how they have a, in their, their data sets at Google, sometimes they could have tables that have thousands of attributes, thousands of fields. But most queries only, again, in OLAP, you only need a subset of them. Or you scan along, find all Andy's orders, or, or find you know, within some date range or whatever. Uh, so. If you store the, the catalog within the file format themselves as, as a column store, so you have a column store catalog representing column store data, you can do all the same, the same tricks and techniques that we do to make OLAP queries on fast and column data. We can do that for our catalog as well to find the things that we're looking for. And that makes it so like when I open a file for the first time, I can quickly find that you figure out where the data is that I'm actually going to need without having to parse the entire uh, schema. And the last one I think was interesting, I think it's important to talk about how uh, their the, sort of the internal transition at Google to being a NoSQL data or NoSQL you know, tech startup, or not a startup, NoSQL tech <laughs> giant, the opposite of a startup, to uh, one of the biggest uh, proponents of SQL based database systems in, you know, in the world. So, as I said, like the, or in the journal paper, it talks about how. 
Dremel was one of the first systems that was sort of pushing for, for as a SQL as a good idea within Google. And then that sort of spread, you know, people realized Ted Cobb was a genius, and they sort of, that sort of spread throughout the other parts of Google. And so as all these different units within the company were building their own database systems with SQL support, they all had their own dialect, their own, their own flavor of SQL that uh, you know, had the things that they, they sort of cared about for the, the product, they were, the, the service they were, they were building. Um, and so this be obviously became untenable. So there was an internal effort called Google SQL where they wanted to have all these systems that were building redundant code, redundant parsers and, and binders and analyzers and type systems and syntax stuff. All, everybody's going to use the same infrastructure for this. Um, and so Dremel was part of that. Spanner is, 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 is based on this. A bunch of other systems are, are, you know, are now using this. So they did also open source all this code uh, to something called Zeta SQL. Um, as far as I know, the only system outside of Google, or so I don't think Google actually uses this because they have their own thing, right? They always have like there's the open source version like Kubernetes, and then they have the internal version like Borg, and you know maybe they have the same the original same lineage, but you know Google still uses whatever they had on, on the inside. So they open source a library called Zeta SQL. Uh, I don't think Google, I don't think they even maintain this anymore. I think it's all external to. To Google now, and the only database system that I know or system that supports this is Apache Beam, which is like a stream processing system. Uh, but no, no database system. I'm not aware of any system that, that, that's based upon this. To me, this is interesting because it's like, uh, if you think about like in the 19, early 1980s, right when IBM said, "Okay, where do you use SQL?" and that became the de facto standard because IBM was huge. Right? Oracle was copying it, and then everyone had to follow along with, with, you know, with SQL. I mean, of course, there's dialects, there's flavors of it. But like, SQL is considered the, the, the gold standard, and everyone's going to be based upon that. Google's a massive company. It's widely influential. They put this thing out, and nobody else uses it. Right? I think, so this, I was just say that, like, we, it's, I think it's going to be never, never, I won't say never, very impossible that everyone will, will converge on a sort of pure single SQL dialect. It's always going to be these, Slight variations in, in fragmentation in, in the in, in the industry, and that's that's probably going to be okay. The only standard I would say that that is just now is probably Postgres, because like, there's a bunch of systems that fork the Postgres parser, like DuckDB. We did this, a bunch of other systems. Like that's probably would be the considered the the de facto flavor of SQL now, but even then, like that's only a small segment of the market. There's Oracle, SQL Server. Everyone, everyone has their own thing. Okay. So I want to finish up talking about three systems that are inspired by or based on uh, uh, on Dremio, Drill, Dremio, or sorry, based on Dremel, Drill, Dremio, and Apollo. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, on, on a full, but like there's a this is a uh, incubating Apache project where they try to build a open source version of the the Shuffle service, similar to what uh, Dremel uses, um, and it supports MapReduce, it supports Spark. Uh, so this space is interesting, but this is still very early. All right, so the most probably, I want to say famous, because that's not the right word, but like the, when people say, what's the open source version of a Dremel? Drill usually is what people think of, right? Because the, you know, the drill, Dremio, Dremio is a drill. The, the naming is, is close enough. Um, so this started in 2012, a year after the uh, Dremel paper came out at a uh, map produce company called MapR. Who here has ever heard of MapR? Nobody, right? They failed. Well, they, they got bought, but, like, but barely. Um, so this was like a, they had their own proprietary version of Hadoop. Think of it like that. Right? So that set of Java was written in C++. Right? It was considered high performance Hadoop, if that was a thing. So what's interesting about them is that they're going to do, the, the basic tenets of, of how Dremel does works uh, apply to a drill. Uh, but they are going to do CoGen, but using this thing called uh, Genio, which is like an embedded uh, Java compiler. So, th so they, they do vectorization. They do all the stuff we talked about before. But they, they actually compile uh, Java as well. The query is into to Java bytecode. So I don't, I don't say Drill is dead, because um, people watch this and get an email and complain. But like MapR got bought for peanuts by HP. And then HP announced in 2020 that they're uh, they're not going to maintain, or not, they're not going to spend resources maintaining it anymore. So it's an open source project. People are still working on it, uh, but it doesn't have the 
I would say it just, there's no company backing it the same way like Dremio is, and there's no uh, there's not a vibrant open source community like in Presto or Trino. Why did it get killed? Why did it get killed? Yeah. HP had to cut costs. So the Apache drill is still alive. It's an Apache project. It can live forever, right? And still being actively maintained. It's just there isn't a company that's like that's like you know. Like a lot of these Apache projects will get spun out of a company, and the company will still like sell commercial, you know, commercial version version of it, make money, and then, then they'll still maintain it, right, as goodwill to the open source community. HP says, you know, they didn't want to spend money on that. Gemio is probably the the, the most vibrant one uh, that's inspired it by uh, Dremel. That's interesting. This was founded in 2015 by somebody who did masters here at CMU. Uh, it's based entirely on Apache Arrow, so the, the CMU guy is actually, I think he was one of the co-inventors of, of, of Arrow. So their big claim that why they're fast is that they rely on what they call reflections, but as far as I can tell, they're just materialized views with a, with a fancy name, um, to speed up query execution on external data files. So the idea is that instead of reading, uh, instead of reading the file, you know, like every file as if it's the first time you've ever seen it, they can maybe cache some additional information or cache the actual results of, of certain queries um, defined by the user itself, and then run the, run the execution on those materialized views or reflections rather than parsing everything from scratch all over again. They also rely on uh, Java-based CoGen. I don't know what compiler they're using. Um, and then, of course, everyone, again, everyone does vectorization at this point. The last one is Impala. So this was started in 2012 by Somebody that worked at Google, he did. He didn't. Uh, he didn't work on. Uh, he didn't work on Dremel. He worked on F1. But obviously, F1 people worked with uh, the Dremel people. So the idea again of this is to try to take the techniques that were built in F1 and Dremel and build an open source version out at Cloudera outside outside of Google. Um, so they do CoGen for at the executor node, but I'll talk about in a second. That is embedded inside the data node. Um, but they only do it for like doing ex expression evaluation and then parsing like CSV files and to speed that things up. So what they do, at least the original version, I don't think this, this still exists because you can't do this obviously on S3. But the way they got better performance is that they didn't treat the, the distributed file system as a black box. You would actually run a little JVM down here, or it was like, I think it was C++. There's a little program down here on the same node where the data was located um, so that you can do predicate pushdown and, and filtering directly where the data is, rather than having to send it over the network. And obviously, this breaks the entire paradigm that, that we've been talking about with these, these, with these object stores, where you can't do that. You can do that with like basic select operations, like an S3. But this was like a whole piece of code that the data system actually could, could coordinate and, and send work to. Uh, but obviously, you can't do that in, um, in, you know, in, in, in S3. So this is still around. Uh, it's an Apache project. It's, I think it's still, they're still developing it. But uh, I mean, Cloudera got eaten alive by Databricks, right? Like uh, Cloudera, Cloudera did not do this, despite being, having the, the name Cloud in the, the title of the company. They did not do a, a pivot to like cloud-hosted services, right? They're still like this on-prem service model, whereas like Databricks sold Cloud as a thing, and, and yes, they had Spark, but they sell you know Databricks the Spark service immediately. Um, and Databricks is going to go IPO, and Cloudera got, I think, that reacquired by, they went IPO, and then they got reacquired by a venture, venture firm or venture capitalist, or, no, private equity. They got reacquired, and it, it became private, and they're going to try to spin out as IPO again. But it's, you know, it's, they've been eclipsed clearly by Databricks. All right, so to finish up, I had you guys read the general paper first because it's the, it predates all of the other systems that we'll talk about, including Snowflake. Um, not just because 2006 when they started working on it, at least that paper came out in 2011. And like I said, that was very influential. The, the shuffle phase, again, it seems, it seems like it's wasteful, but it opens up a bunch of engineering opportunities, makes things easier, and in some cases, you actually do get, you get better performance. And I would say overall, what I like about this paper too is that it shows the benefit of decomposing the, the data system's internal components and, 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 and pieces into separate services to allow them to either get developed independently with either separate teams and then scale and improve efficiency separately, or it also abstracts away the, 
what would be a you know additional code that you would have to embed into different uh, in different parts of the system. If you just expose it as a single service that handles sort of everything for you, then that makes it cleaner to write the worker code or the other parts of the system. So again, the shuffle node stuff is just get and set or maybe delete. And you don't worry about how to get the data to the next stage. You just say, if I write it here, someone will take care of me and get it to the next stage. So I, I think that, that part is, is very unique and interesting. OK, any questions? <laughs> That's my favorite all time. <laughs> what is it? Yes, it's the SP Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I could do it like a geo. Ice cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. The homies on the cup, so yeah, I'm a fool because I drink fruit. Quick the bus, a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a 40. A six pack 40 act gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>